All right. All right. So we're going to get things kicked off here. Aaron, thanks so much for joining us today and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Sam Kirshner here, Vice President at Village Global. We're excited to be joined by Aaron Harris this morning. As many of you know, Aaron has advised founders on hundreds of Series A and B processes that have raised over 300 billion. Aaron is going to share some pro tips and then we'll take Q&A probably throughout and then after as well. Um, please add your questions to the Q&A that we have here, not in the chat. We have an actual Q&A function and we'll do our best to address uh, what is top of mind for everyone. And with that, Aaron, take it away. Thanks so much, Sam. And um, thanks for Sheila, to Sheila and Tess for organizing. This is this is really fun for me to do. Let me give you all uh, just a little quick background about me and why I like talking about fundraising. Um, my name is Aaron Harris. Uh, I run a company called Mogeed and Co, where we advise early stage founders on how to raise excellent Series A's and Series B's, actually, which is an extremely fun topic for me. Uh, it might not sound like fun, but for me, it, it is. Um, and over the last three years, we've advised founders across uh, 27 rounds, rounds 28 and 29 uh, terms are signed, and we're moving towards close on both of them. And that'll put us at about $900 million raised with our founders. But before Mogeed, and the place where I kind of built the experience that I needed to, to do what I do now, I was at YC for seven and a half years as a partner. Um, I funded companies like Scale and Deal and Rappi and built the Series A program there, where I actually advised hundreds of companies on their Series A's and B's, raised about three and a half billion dollars alongside those founders. And I've, I've distilled a lot of that into what we're going to talk about today, um, which is this thing that I think about as, as maybe the biggest question that founders have when they're thinking about fundraising, which is... Um, essentially how to know when you're ready to raise a, a Series A, because it's extremely confusing. And in order to, to answer that question, um, we're going to try to dispel some myth, myths, but I'm going to borrow very heavily from photography, actually. Uh, I, I'm like a hobbyist photographer. It's one of my favorite things to do. And one of my favorite photographers was this guy named Henri Cartier-Bresson. He invented, basically invented the concept of street photography, which is... Uh, walking around in a city or a place with people and just putting your camera up to your face and, and taking a shot. And he had this idea called the decisive moment, which is a specific magical moment when a photographer makes a decision to freeze time and, and create a photograph. Now, that can seem to non-photographers like luck, but true decisive moments come from planning, positioning, and action, uh, which the same thing is true about fundraisers. So, that concept, right, is important because there is no critical path, just like no deterministic path to an A. There's no set of magical numbers or investor emails, no matter how fawning they are, that magically trigger an A. And there's no way to cleanly predict what you need to do for an A. Instead, the best founders do something a little bit different, which is that they're, they're tracking the market. They're constantly updating their mental models of, of the market, of their place within it. They know what investors are thinking and know when the odds are most in their favor to raise. And then they actively choose a time to go raise around instead of like letting timing or letting a process happen to them. And to get this right, you need three core elements. The, the first of these elements is largely in your control. You, you need to build a great company. Now, how you define greatness may change over time, but there are common elements amongst all of the best startups. And the most important of these is what um, Sequoia generally calls, you know, be building an enduring company, something that is going to last for a really long time at an, a very, very large scale. Now, the second element you need, which is partly in your control, but is also partly a function of the market, which is you need the right reason to raise money. That reason is going to shift a little bit over the life of your business um, as your business changes, as the market changes. Um, but that is where you essentially build your narrative core, right? It's the interface between what you're building and what the market wants to see. That's where you kind of communicate the story of why you need money. And the final element is almost entirely out of your control, which is you need an investor with a mind prepared for your pitch, for your story. Now, what you can control is your, you know, you can find these investors before your fundraising. Hopefully you find them during a fundraise, but it's nice to identify them first. And it's possible to influence their thinking over time if you have enough time to do it through dialogue, through conversation, through a long relationship, but you cannot force them to think in a certain way. Now, these elements all kind of feed each other, one into the other, back around and around. Um, and it's up to you to decide when these elements are in the best balance that create an opportunity for you to launch a fundraise. 
So let's let's talk about these one one after the other. And again, you know, feel free to launch questions into chat whenever you have them. Um, and Sam and I will kind of pull those out and, and and try to answer them as we go. The less I talk at a stretch, the better. Oh, and one thing that's really important that I should say. Um, anything I say throughout this presentation that sounds um, like uh, explicit advice on an explicit thing to do, like only do this thing this time or always do this thing, please don't take it that way. Everything that I'm talking about here is meant is best interpreted as a framework for thinking about a specific situation. The interesting thing about advising founders is that every situation is slightly different. And so I think about all these structures as a framework for interpreting specific you know, founder situations, fundraising situations, and then you have to tailor the advice and tailor what you do based on your own situation, which is really freaking hard for what it's worth. Okay, let's talk about having the right business. And throughout the photography, the, all the photographs are from uh, Arnery Cartier-Bresson. I will resist most of the urge to break them down, but I'm, I'm going to just point this photograph out, which is one of my favorite photographs of all time. And it embodies this idea of the decisive moment, right? So it, it, think about this photograph. There was, there was something that Bresson fully controlled, which was the camera he picked that morning that he walked out with. He had that. That was set. No one else could influence him. He picked the, the camera in the film, right? But then he was walking through the street and he saw something in the world that he decided, I want to stop and take this picture. And actually, if you look at the frame, that railing essentially follows a golden spiral. It's like a, you know, a, a ratio that's very pleasing to our eyes. And then, so that was like partly in his control, partly out. He didn't build it, but he found it. He decided to stop. And then he waited. And something happened. This cyclist went past and he snapped the shutter. Right? He closed the shutter to, to grab that specific thing. Um, Sheila, thank you so much for posting the Magnum Mike, that is awesome. Um, yeah, check out those photographs. They're great. Also, other great photographers on there. Okay, so let's go back to fundraising and stop talking about photography, though. I could. Um, all right, so your business, right? Like your startup, it's not an income statement. It's not a corporate charter. It's a story, right? Your business is a story. It's, it's a tool that basically validates your particular view of the world and how that world is changing. That's the thing about startups. It's different than, you know, um, opening a corner store, which is an incredible thing to do. But most of the time, that's not, hey, I think the world is going to change in a certain way and I'm going to build something to take advantage of that or to change the world. That's what startups are, right? And you've already convinced yourselves that you're working on a massive idea. You've convinced some seed investors, you've convinced Village, you've convinced you know, your co-founder or some employees that what you are building has a shot at being gigantic. And that is a really good start. Right, you've done that first part of figuring out the right business to raise an A. And, and these things are kind of really critical, these, these four points, which is, you know, um, while every startup starts as an idea, it's the scale that matters. That's the thing that's like the difference between a corner store and a startup in, in a lot of ways. And the reason that's important is that venture capital is the funding path as a funding path. It only makes sense for certain companies. It only makes sense because they have to scale massively, massively ahead of your ability to like fund it with cash flow or get a loan. And most of the things, most of the startups that get built will fail. Most of them will go out of business and certainly most of them will fail to become big companies. So let's say you figured this thing out. You have the right kind of business to go build a May, to go to, to build a big company, the right, right idea. Uh, well, you have, to, you have to figure out how to get money for that thing. And that's where stuff starts to get tricky, right? And the place where it, it so often gets tricky is when you start to deploy your money, right? You get your seed money, you start to deploy it. And, and now you start thinking, okay, like, what does it mean to succeed? And one of the ways that you and, and investors will continuously evaluate whether or not you should get money, whether or not you're succeeding, is by looking at how quickly you execute against the vision, the story that you've told, which usually happens through metrics, right? You can think of metrics as the first pillar of your company's story that goes beyond the kind of world building you do in your initial pitch and the way that you talk uh, in, in a seed pitch. It's, it's the thing where you start to gain evidence from the world as to whether or not you were right. But metrics fool all of us, right? Because they're the only seemingly firm thing in this entire system. Your startup changes, your story changes, the employees change, the investors change, all this stuff is constantly moving around. The Numbers seem firm, right? Provided they're kind of 
real numbers and not fake, but those are firm. Like you, you, you have as much revenue as you have on a given day in a given month. The problem is that precision doesn't necessarily produce like results of fundraising. And the reason for this is that fundraising benchmarks are, they're just a, they're a mirage, right? At best, they're a moving target. You can get some information on what great looks like by asking investors sort of like during a meeting, what great looks like to them. And they might give you some answers. You can ask other seed companies where they are, but you won't get fundraising triggers. And this bothers the hell out of me because you see so many blog posts um, which say, oh, if you get a million dollars in ARR, that's when you should go fundraise. Or you talk to founders and they're like, oh, well, you're not at a million dollars in ARR, don't go fundraise. So here's a way to test this for what it's worth. Um, go talk to a Series A investor or, or, or ask the Village team, right? Hey, the last five rounds that got done in the portfolio, what was their ARR? You're not going to get everyone was at exactly $1 million in ARR and growing 30% a month. It, it's just not, that's not how that works. And the way to understand this is by understanding how investors think. Okay, The best investors in the world, the good ones, who get to stay in business for a while, they're natural optimists. Right? They want to believe that your business is going to be huge. But they're extremely skeptical because they've seen so many failures. And so what an investor will do, this is what I did in every, every YC interview I ever did. You hear the pitch. And you think, okay, what's the path to this being a company that generates a billion dollars in revenue or $2 billion, $10 billion in revenue a year? Great, cool. Let me put that aside. Do I believe that that exists? Yes, great. I'm willing to have the next conversation. What are the blockers? What are the risks? Metrics are useful in the context of fundraising insofar as they show that you're overcoming the risks that you, you founder team, founding team, have between you and that big opportunity and that you're executing and overcoming those challenges at a rate that seems impressive. And so this is why you see founders with nothing built raise 30, $40 million series A's or a billion dollar series A, right? The, 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 um, uh, Ilya's new company, um, it raises a billion dollars out of the gate with nothing built. Understand why. Right. Sometimes the risk is it's a commercial risk. Right. Well, if you're a repeat founder that built a company to $100 million in revenue before, people won't be worried that you can do it. They understand that you can do go to market. If it's a product risk, something super complicated, well, then you're going to have to build more things. If it's execution risk that people are fundamentally worried about, you have to execute for longer. And market risk, there's a customer sizing thing happening. And so you just have to understand what your big risks are and what metrics you need to produce to overcome those, those risks. Aaron, just now, to jump well, in real quick. Yeah. I think this is a really important point that you're making here. And it's something that I've seen a lot of founders struggle with, which is trying to understand, you know, they have a unique business, which might have mm -hmm. different metrics than they, you know, than a lot of businesses, like in terms of ARR, it's a marketplace, it's FinTech. Yeah. How do you recommend founders really figure this out? Especially when it can be hard to go to a series A investor and be like, Hey, what do I need to be true? Because they might not be honest. So how have you like, yeah. I guess, really tactically, how do you recommend people go out and figure out what, what they need to be true? Or is that just not even possible? Like, is it just too challenging given how diverse businesses are? No, I, I, I think it's a little in between. I, I don't think there's a perfect answer, but there are only so many kinds of businesses in the world. Like, yes, yeah, some are more complex than others, but loosely speaking, the, the metrics that you'll see on screen right now, like these are the categories of things you need to worry about. You know, if you're a SaaS business, the growth rate, the retention, the NDR cash efficiency, ACVs matter. If you're consumer, it's growth rates, CAC over LTV, retention usage. Like there are things that we've all kind of commonly accepted are the important things. And so then the question is like, okay, what are the, what are the numbers I have to post against those things? And that, and we're going to come back to this as we talk about how to kind of interact with investors and, and pull information for them, is it, it's in dialogue, right? I've seen a number of companies over the last year raise Series A's at 100, 200, 300K ARR. And other companies, the company that we talked to, they have $10 million in ARR and cannot raise a Series A. Wow. You know, and, and, and there are good reasons for those things. But it it is, at the end of the day, a question of narrative and a question of how your narrative fits your numbers and your numbers support your narrative insofar as they exist. 
Now, the, the even trickier one level deep question is if you know that numbers are coming in a certain way, how do you time your fundraise relative to the production of those numbers? Like, you know, there's an inflection point coming. Do you fundraise before the inflection point or after? That's, again, that's why every situation is interesting and fun. That's why this job is interesting and fun, honestly. Um, okay, we're going we're gonna to do some, awesome. some partition, par- participation here. Um, it, it, throw this into chat, okay? Um, if, if you, if you so desire, and I'll try to pick apart some of this stuff. This is fun to do if we could talk to each other, but it's a webinar we can't, but basically, um, put down number one, what's your biggest risk? What's the biggest risk to your business? Two, does your metric exact address that risk? What is your metric and does it address the risk? And three, how do you know? Give every, I'll give, give folks a couple minutes. Let's see who's the fastest typist and bravest here. Ah, so Blaine, you pulled out like such a good one here, which is market risk. Uh, I'm assuming you mean market size, I think. Market size is like the most difficult risk to overcome for an investor, okay? Uh, You basically can't do it. If an investor doesn't believe the market exists, you are pretty much going to be, it's almost impossible to convince them. But, but... That's why canvassing the market ahead of time is so important and understanding the investor. Now, I managed to pull this off personally for my seed round. So I built a marketplace for local tutoring. I'm not going to go into it too much. But um, I, the first time I taught, Sequoia led our seed round. This is a long time ago. And the first time I talked to, uh, to the partner there, Greg McAdoo, um, he basically says, like, ah, tutoring, small market. And I was standing in a circle of people. It was it was at YC one night, um, and we were talking about something else, um, which was kind of weird. I, it, it was a very silly conversation about labor history. I don't know why we were talking about it, but you, we we got into the side topic. I was like, well, actually, it's it's actually a pretty big market. It's you know six billion dollars, and that's you know the the known market. It's bigger beyond that. And he's like, wait, what? And for whatever reason. I was able to kind of turn him on to just how large the market was, but that wasn't the answer. It took like another month and a half to actually convince him. So you can't do it. But had I walked in to Sequoia's office and tried to pitch them explicitly, like I'm going to pitch you on this thing, they never would have taken the pitch. It was because I was talking to him in a lower pressure situation. We were able to have like an almost intellectual conversation about the size of the market that we were able to shift a little bit for what it's worth. Um, All right, competition risk and market share. Oh, sorry, Sam, you were going to say something. I was going to say an interesting thing with Blaine also is that he's in cannabis, right? And so the mm-hmm. market share is small, but there's regulation mm-hmm. and there's these other things mm-hmm. that could actually affect it. And so that drive, that drive is part, partly driven by narrative, right? To your point. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, like when you're in a regulated industry, um, there are a bunch of other things that people are looking at that exist kind of on the side of like the market size thing. Like, yeah, people want to smoke weed and, and, um, eat gummies. Like, that's not the question. The question is more around, hey, can you get through the regulatory hurdles across different places as that market grows and capture market share? So again, it's finding the right person who understands that well enough and is willing to take the bet. Um, all right, on it, you're asking like, are you differentiated as a, as a, as a market risk? I, um, I think that is rarely the risk for what it's worth. Um, I think when people say, Hey, we we don't see the differentiation here. We don't see the moat. That's actually code for they don't believe that you can do go to market well. That you're not going to be able to get customers, and that you're bad at execution. Um, fundamentally, most businesses are replicable, um, unless you have a lock on the only like I don't know uranium mine in 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 a given market and you you protect that regular from a regulatory perspective like anything can be copied if it's technology the question is can you execute long enough and, and do go to market well enough that you can grow fast and like then you can start to do things like create lock-in effects and networks so um again i don't know you i don't know your business so can't speak for it 100 percent. but there's usually something underlying that question um steven same thing on like the crowded market like it, it's it's not about the crowded market. And I will say customer testimonials and awareness metrics, not a good metric for investors. Um, I always like to joke that when founders say our customers love us, it was code for, uh, but they won't pay us. Um, 
investors are are kind of attuned to that dynamic. Yeah, so, numbers speak. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, you can all feel free to keep throwing this in. Um, I'll come back to them if if we have a gap, but I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going because I I, I want to make sure we get we get through the the material. Um, all right, so now we come to like the right reason to raise, and this is one I get in trouble for quite a bit, or, or people get themselves into trouble with. But basically, um, look, fundraising is held up by the press um, and by a lot of founders as, as a trophy is the goal, but it's not. It's just not a trophy. It's just a tool, right? And founders who think that fundraising is the trophy, is the goal, tend to incinerate huge amounts of money and end up failing. Um, you see it all the time, honestly. And, and the best possible reason to fundraise, it's honestly, for me, it's the only reason to fundraise is because you need money to grow. Like that's the tool that you need to grab. And, and that, it, think about it like a tool, like a hammer or a keyboard. You use capital because it unlocks growth. You need to hire people. You need to pay those people higher salaries because, you know, an anthropic keeps hiring your best engineers away from you. Or you need to buy GPU, actual GPUs or GPU time or something like that. The specifics here vary by business, but the theme is always the same. Now, there are cases where you raise money because you can. Two things on this. One, it this is tautological, right? It's true because it's true. It's self-referential. Of course, you raise money when you can. If you couldn't raise money, then you wouldn't be able to do it. But the second point here is this is extremely dangerous logic. Right? Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do it. Something all of our parents told us that we tell our kids. Um, there are a lot of companies who follow this logic to raise massive rounds in 20 and 21. And um, they are now sitting on hugely overinflated marks that are basically impossible to meet, like huge piles of cash that are slowly burning away without the ability to hit the revenue targets that they'll need or the growth targets or any targets. It's a bad position to be in. Much better to raise less money at a lower price in most cases. Now, that's the reasons to raise money, but there are also specifically bad reasons to fundraise, um, which uh, there's all kinds of opinions on here. This is just one opinion. But um, some founders seem to like raising money because it looks fun. And they see the end, they see the press release and the party that you threw that for some reason, you know, like a bunch of celebrities were at, looks great. Fundraising is not fun. It just isn't fun. Maybe your seed round was easy. You will get punched in the face really, really hard by a fundraise at some point. Um, we just finished up a, a, a fundraise with a founder. Um, the, the end result is, is unbelievably good. And the process to get there was extremely painful. It was, a three, it was, it was from, from the first pitch... Actually, not even unbelievably painful. I'm going to go to a really painful one. We had a fundraise that took nine months. Nine months. Founder got everything they wanted in the end. But it took a long time. It was brutal, but they needed the money to go to, to do the things that they need to do. And I've seen a lot of those. You get told no. You get told your business is terrible. You stop sleeping. Like, don't fundraise because it looks fun. Find something else to do. Which is another one of the reasons I've seen founders raise money because they don't know what else to do for the business. They're like, well, we don't know how to grow any faster. Uh, we're not sure what to do with the product. Let's raise money. That feels good. Like, well, that's a milestone. That'll get the team rallied up and build morale. No, no, that doesn't work. Right. Um, now there's a weird one, which is your competitor raise money. So for the most part, this is a terrible reason to raise money. The logic goes something like this, which is... Um, Hey, it works in two directions. Hey, our competitor raised money. They're going to get all the press. We need to raise money so that we get press um, and so we can compete. Um, that doesn't really, that's not the way the world works. Like customers don't buy software or don't buy products because of a fundraise. They end up buying the best thing for the most part. So even if your competitor raises money, if you don't need the money, don't raise the money. Um, I'm going I'm to come back to that in one second. The other way the logic works is I'm going to raise money from all the good investors, even though I don't need it, so that my competitor can't raise money. This is like in those competitive markets, right? It's such, it sounds so smart. I think people who do this are like, well, I'm playing 4D chess. By the way, regular chess is sufficiently difficult that you don't have to play some other higher dimensional version of chess. I've always been confused by that one, even having watched a lot of Star Trek as a kid. Um, 
The problem is there is always another source of capital available to founders who are good and are doing good things. And actually what happens when you go and raise a lot of money from a lot of different investors and you think you're locking up the market, what actually happens is investors who couldn't get into that round then start looking for your competitor because it looks interesting. So you will catalyze fundraising for your competitors by going and raising an unnecessarily large round for what it's worth. Okay, now the, the one thing here that is true is if you are building an enterprise company and you discover that you are losing deals because your competitor is better capitalized than you are and your customers do not believe that you will survive against them because you don't have enough on the balance sheet, that is a reason to raise money because your competitor raised. But I'll circle back to the previous point I made, which is in that case, actually, the barrier to growth is needing money because you can't grow without it. Right, so it does kind of circle back to the earlier part of the framework for what it's worth. There's also this thing that some investors will do, um, present company excluded, which is sometimes your insiders will tell you to raise money because they want to get a markup or they want you know you know get a, a co investment with a big fancy firm or something like that. I see that a lot, and new investors will tell you that you should absolutely raise money. It's such a good idea, so that they can get a piece of your company. Now, if that advice coincides with the fact that you actually do need money, great, do that thing. But it has to be, um, um, uh, it, it has to overlap with the real reasons. Okay. Now let's talk about the investor who, investors are not unlike this extremely happy young man with two giant bottles of wine and people chasing him because he looks like he knows what's good. Um, the way you you get to know the investors, the way you try to like figure out where you sit relative to the market is with casual meetings with the investors, right? We'll, we'll get to this in a second about how to do them specifically. We call them coffee meetings. I know it's not perfect. Some people don't drink coffee. Often these are virtual. You could drink coffee at the same time as they are through a computer screen, but whatever. Um, but, but the way that you figure out it, if investors are interested is to have actual meetings outside of the context of a fundraise. And this directly contravenes advice I used to give, um, which is that if you're not fundraising, don't meet with investors, just build. That advice is true for some businesses at certain times. But for the most part, especially post-seed, you need to consistently engage with investors to do three things. The first thing is you need to test out the story, right? You need to figure out what actually resonates with them because they're an audience. You need to see what excites them before you get to the point where you're pitching with all the chips on the line, right? Don't walk into the pitch cold, never having told your story to somebody else. Test it with your audience as much as you can. The second thing you're doing is building relationships with a set of investors so that they're ready for you and your business when you go to raise money, right? Think of it as helping, you know, Investors love to talk about having prepared minds. We've prepared our minds. We've done the research. You can do that for them. You can walk in and teach them about a new space in a way that just happens to make you look amazing and like the best bet. Right? So you can influence that preparation, and that's good for you. So you should do it. The other thing about the relationship is, um, well, two, two things about it. One, if you go and raise a Series A, the person who leads the round is going to sit on your board for the next five to 10 years. You don't want to be in a shotgun marriage situation with that person. You don't want to get to know that person only in the context of you fundraising when they're in sell mode all the time. Get to know them outside of that over a period of time. The other thing you want to do here is um, let them build a relationship with you. Investors are more likely to invest in you if they know who you are and think you're excellent. And what you do in these meetings to demonstrate your excellence is you like, drop breadcrumbs. They actually throw darts, right? Like you meet with them. Let's say you meet with them in September. You say, ah, oh, blah, 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 we're talking. You give them very specific pieces of information. You throw a dart at the future, say, hey, we're going to be here, you know, in, in X number of months. And then you're going to go uh, uh, outperform that number. And then you create this impression that you're constantly doing amazing things. That's good. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But the final thing you want to do here is to get information on the market. Right. Find out what they're thinking, how the investors are thinking about it. Ultimately, you need them, right? Figure out what they're excited about, what they're seeing, what's interesting, what's not interesting. And just as a really specific example, though it's by no means um, categorical, 
uh, there's an investor I know, they, they, they focus mostly on Bs and Cs. And this investor was telling me that in 2021, the average ARR of a Series B company that they saw was three and a half million dollars. And in the last 12 months, it was 11. That's a huge delta. Now, that's not to say you're absolutely going to succeed with 11 or fail at less than three and a half, whatever. But at least you know what they're seeing, right? At least you know uh, what, like, what they, what your competition is, essentially, for for the dollars in the world. Now, these coffee meetings, again, not necessarily coffee, there, there is a very specific framework for thinking about them. They are casual. They are not a pitch. You are not walking in with a deck. The idea here is you give the investors enough information such that they have to ask for another meeting, such that they don't have enough information to say yes or no. Right? You leave them hungry. And they're always going to be looking for enough information to make a decision. That's, that's their the, the kind of model. You don't want them to do that. You want to do these meetings with, call it, 20 plus investors over the course of time to find out which ones are interested. And then you focus on the subset that seem most excited and build a longest term relationship. So you want to start this six to 12 months ahead of your round so that with the best of those investors, you've had a chance to meet them somewhere between two and four times before you come in and pitch. That way, when you come to the pitch, by the way, so here's here's a mistake people make all the time. Um, getting ahead of myself, but uh, talk to a founder in the link. Great, we're ready to fundraise. We're going in three days, Why are you going in three days, have you lined up your meetings? No, we're sending out intro requests today. Cool. How many warm intros do you have? Four. Wow. But you need to pitch 40 to 80 investors in a Series A. Where are those going to come from? And then their heads explode. And by the way, those are the numbers. You should be going to market with a Series A with at least 40 investors that you're going to pitch. You can prepare a good chunk of those ahead of time, which will help you move the process along better. Right, and so in those meetings, you're 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 trying different versions of the story, seeing what creates sparkle, seeing what creates that follow up, and if at all possible, only meet with decision makers. Watch out for title creep. But I, I want to. There was a social media Twitter brouhaha kerfuffle thing, which are two very old person words. But um, a couple months ago, about like don't meet with associates, and then other people were like no meet with associates and. Everyone was very angry and, and as usual uh, with social media, extremely uh, lacking in nuance. So here's the way I think about it. Um, it is true that if you are going to raise a Series A from a traditional Series A firm, the person who is going to do that deal generally has the term general partner or partner in their title. Those are the most useful, generally, people to build relationships with. However, Different firms operate differently. There are many firms where principals do and can and do lead Series A's. There are certain firms where the firm or the partnership relies on the associate level to actually find the deals that they're going to do. So you have to know the firm and know where that person sits within the firm. And then at the end of the day, remember that you are playing an extremely long game. It is not an infinite game. You do not fundraise infinite times in your life but your relationships matter. And if you have the opportunity to sit down for half an hour with someone extremely smart who's demonstrated that they're smart, interesting, have stuff to say, the worst thing that happens out of that meeting is you've lost half an hour. I'm not saying do 10 of these a week, but if it's an associate and you think the associate's really good, have the meeting with the associate. One, it might be a nice conversation. It's good to have conversations with interesting people. Two, that person, if they are quite good, will eventually be a general partner and in position to give you lots of money. And they will remember that you were not a schmuck. And if you're gonna turn someone down, just please don't be a schmuck. I've seen some really, really shitty behavior on behalf of founders towards VCs. And I know VCs sometimes meet street founders. I get it, not an excuse. Be polite. If you can't meet with someone, don't meet with them. Don't tell them, I don't, I'm not gonna meet with you because you are an associate and you can't make decisions. And I've seen people say that and it really bothers me. Please don't do that, right? Awesome. Okay. Aaron, just to jump in real quick, we have a couple of Q&A questions, which I think are worth highlighting. Yeah. One here from Stedman. In these conversations, what info should and shouldn't be shared? So for any info we shouldn't share, can you share some tactics for declining to disclose? Yes. Stedman's had oh. problems where like, you essentially decline to answer something and then it makes it less the conversation awkward. How, how would you approach that? Yeah. All right. Um, I'll take that in order. 
Um, the, the, the pieces of information you want to share are generally the high level bits about the company that give the impression of how well you're doing without letting someone understand the full picture of the business. So easy frame of, easy like rule of thumb, you'll share top line revenue, you won't share detailed retention figures, right? You'll share growth rates, you won't share, you know, detailed breakdown of, of ACVs and sales cycles or something like that. Your ability to share less information, your ability, your, your, the requirement that you share information is inversely related um, or inversely proportional to how well you're doing. If like the growth is insane, they're not going to ask that many other questions. It's true in a fundraise too, by the way. So you pick a couple things and you give those pieces of information. Now, investors are good interviewers. Good investors are good interviewers. And so they will ask you for pieces of information you're not willing to share. So this is what I learned from a friend of mine who's a reporter at the, a, a writer at the New Yorker. Um, she called me and she's like, look, I was like, how do you interview? I was trying to get better at interviewing at YC. Like, what do I do when I want a piece of information? She goes, well, you ask a question. If they don't answer the question, you just ask the same question again. And then you just stare at them. And humans, most of us, are conditioned to need to fill awkward silences with new information. And that's what I used to wait for when I was an investor. It's what your investors will do. So... What you can do as a founder is a few things. One, embrace the awkwardness. You're just going to have to embrace the awkwardness. Be comfortable staring back awkwardly. I know it's weird, but I've sat and stared. at some, When people do this to me, I will happily sit and just stare at someone and be like. Now, that said, another line you can deploy, which I think is, is usually the better thing to do, is if someone asks for a piece of information you don't want to share, you can just say, listen, I totally understand why you know that. Um, Happy to share that level of information when we're fundraising. We're not right now. And that's not a piece of information we're willing to disclose. If they ask it again, well, you say it again. Now, the way that you turn this away from the awkwardness is the thing that we're not going to dig in too deeply today. But the coffee meetings are not monologues. It's not you giving a 30-minute pitch. It is a conversation. And so you walk into every single one of these meetings with a set of things that you want to ask about. And always have one of those sitting in your, like, in the side of your brain so that if there's an awkward silence, you can just say, listen, I really don't want to talk about that. Happy to share it later. I was wondering, you know, this other company you invested in seemed to have an extremely effective strategy for, you know, reaching CISOs at the Fortune 500. How did they get that started? Like, what did you see that worked so well? Because we're trying to do the same thing. And we just, like, we've got, we, we're okay at it, but I know we could be better and you've seen best in the class, best in class. Right, have those questions ready so you can flip it back on them. That's the best thing that you can do. Awesome. I have another one here uh, from Azam. What's the ideal way to frame the email outreach that you'd like to have a casual coffee or Zoom meeting with? Like, how do you yeah. actually go about teeing those conversations yeah. up? Is it warm intros? Is it with outreach? Like, how do you think about that? Warm intros are always the best. It's it's. Pure fact, like just, if you can get a warm intro, get a warm intro. Um, now you still have to queue up that warm intro. You have to tell the person what to say, because what I've seen happen a lot is angels love to help and they'll rush in and say, Hey, you have to meet with this company. They're so good. They're going to fundraise in like a month or two months. Blah, blah. Then that person, the investor now has the idea that you're fundraising and they're coming in with a very different thing. So what you want to tell your, your, either your existing angels or your friend who's going to introduce you or in your cold email, what you want to say is, listen, you know, I'd love to meet with you um, and start to build a relationship. Um, we're not fundraising right now, but I want to make sure that when we do fundraise, we're talking to people that we know and, and who we've gotten to know. And in particular, I'm wondering how, you know, we're doing X and I love what you wrote about Y, would love to understand how that works. So like, give a specific reason why you want to meet. They know the reason. They know it's to like feel them out and see whether or not they want to invest, but that's, that's kind of what you do. Yeah, it's about trying, like essentially showing you actually care about that person and making the effort. Yeah. yeah. The, the other thing that's interesting about the way that you're talking about this in coffee meetings is it almost implies in person, right? How do you yeah. view in person versus a Zoom meeting? Like how much does live versus not live matter in some of these instances? I mean, look, you, you, in person conversations are so much higher fidelity. They're just better. I mean, this is a wonderful webinar, like, but it, think about how much better and more fun it would be if we were all in a room together. And I feel terrible because, uh, 
you guys invited me to do this in person live uh, at the beginning of the summer and I couldn't make it. Um, so hopefully we'll fix that, you know, this coming year, but, you know, think about just how much more information you get just from the, you know, the, the, the facial expressions and, and how someone is holding their cup of coffee. Like some of us are better at reading this than others, but it's just better. That said, it's better to have the meeting than not have it because you can't do, go in person. Right. Yeah. Um, and so you just have to look for different things uh, and, 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 and try the, the important point, by the way, is to do it and to try and to gather information and to do the thing that we'll talk about next, which is measuring the investor interest out of that comes out of those meetings. Not enough to just have the meeting, right? It's not just a fun thing. You're actually looking for the indications of interest. Awesome. I'll let you continue through about 15 okay. minutes left and then we can jump to Q&A sure. once you're all settled. Sure. Um, so, so these meetings, like, right, they're, they're, there's a way to do them. They're a tool, like raising money is a tool. Everything, the, the way that I think about all this, by the way, it, in my head, I call it process-driven fundraising. And I would love to like go out there and talk about it a lot. But if I call it PDF, which is the obvious acronym, I would uh, probably end up in a lot of lawsuits with a very well-resourced company. So, But everything is like part of the process. Everything is a tool and part of the process. And, and the thing that you're doing out of these meetings is you're trying to measure the interest of investors, which is tricky um, because investors are naturally excited, right? They're natural optimists. They're professionally excited. They're always excited about what you're doing, right? So what you need to do is ask them for things that they have to spend political capital to do. And the degree to which they're willing to spend that political capital on your behalf is the only real indication of interest in your business and in investing in your business. And the weird thing here is that you care more about the amount of political capital that they spend than how useful that thing is for you. I know that sounds insane, but it's almost like a, uh, it's just a test, honestly. Now, if you are doing building a B2B business right, and you're selling to startups or larger companies, and that coincides with who that person has, and you're able to ask for things that then lead to sales, that's even better. I know a company that got $6 million in incremental sales from investor introdu from introductions made by investors who did not get a chance to lead the series A. Pretty good. Now it's tricky if you're doing consumer or something like that, then it's thinking about, oh, who does this person know that's built a great growth engine? Can I talk to that person? You, you can find things. Not perfect, but you can find things, right? Um, note that it's not, hey, I would love to have another coffee. That's fine, but that's their job. It's not, oh, I'd love you to meet another one of my partners. That could be an indication of real interest, but that's not really what we're looking for. It's very hard to sometimes like find the edge here. The other, oh, 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 super fun. Um, beware of investors who want to have coffee, but it's at their office and all of a sudden there's five other partners on the invitation. That's called a pitch meeting. To the extent possible, do these in neutral locations, coffee shop, go for a walk, that kind of thing. I understand that it can't always happen, but I will say that the most awkward conversations of my life, and I've had some very awkward conversations, uh, but I think some of the most awkward conversations of my life are those ones like in a VC's interior office um, just to like have coffee. Uh, they're awful uh, for whatever reason. The energy is just really weird. All right. Decisive moment. How you choose, how you use all this stuff. And Sorry, I can't stop myself. Look at this picture, right? That was done with a film camera 80 years ago. And that person's foot has not yet touched the water. I mean, hold, no burst shooting here. That's freaking great. This guy, he was, a, he was amazing. Okay. Um, so, so how do you know? How do you, how do you like choose your decisive moment? The first thing is, you know, and really the only thing is you have the right story for the time. And, and, and Series A's are mostly about story and your business fits the narrative. It's narrative that you develop. You have an inflection point in front of you that's coming together. That's like giving you the lot, the, the reason, the push to say, oh, this big thing is about to happen. There's excitement happening. Let's capitalize on the excitement. And investors are buying that narrative, which you know, because they're running around and doing work for you. That's your moment. It's when you roll the dice. And I, I will not say you have a hundred percent chance of success. There's no such thing. You know, people say, oh, I got preempted and we, I didn't have to do anything. BS. Like if you got preempted, you were giving information to the market. People knew what was going on, even if you don't admit it or don't know what you were doing. And when those elements are all in your favor, you need to be ready for it. 
right? Don't kick off a process. Don't go into meetings if, if you don't have a deck yet. Build your deck. It's pretty easy once you know your story and you've practiced it, right? That's the thing about the coffee meetings. It helps you figure out what your story is going to be so that you're not up till midnight, like moving things around in Figma and trying to figure out a story. And if it's the right moment, well, you've done the coffee meeting. So you know who your first, you know, 15 investor emails are to for scheduling. So sending those emails is relatively easy. And your investors, your existing investors are ready for it because you've telegraphed and they're ready to make the introductions you need. So that within like 48 hours of deciding to go, you have 30 meetings or 40 meetings scheduled. Right. And like, don't get caught at that moment of when you're ready, of when you have the inflection point, when the narrative momentum is, 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 is there, when it's the decisive moment, don't get caught there suddenly scrambling. Prepare, like everything in your life, everything at your startup, you prepare for everything, prepare, prepare for this. It's worth it. It drives better outcomes. It really does. Let me run quickly through uh, uh, some screw ups that I've seen. Uh, this is not by any means an exhaustive list of ways in which you can destroy a fundraise, but it's some of the ones that I see most often. And then we'll have a little bit of time for, for questions. Um, and you can always email me questions afterwards if, if we don't get to it. So um, we kind of already covered this, the pop-up fundraise, like all of a sudden one day you wake up and decide you're going to go fundraise and try to catalyze it out of thin air. Please don't do that. Um, artificial deadlines. This is a great one. This is the thing that everyone loves to pretend works. Um, you you kick off a fundraise and, you, and in your first meeting, you say, hey, we we're, first meetings are today. We're expecting term sheets in three days. Uh, founders love doing this or love talking about doing this because they heard of someone who did it and it went well. And it makes you feel like, you know, a ninja fundraiser, which is a silly term. Um, uh, it's a bad idea for a couple of reasons. The, the first and most important is it completely actually blows your leverage. Uh, the, the theory is, hey, if I tell people they only have you know 72 hours to give us a term sheet, they'll feel a lot of pressure. Um, investors know when a process is going quickly. They feel it in the air. They feel the electricity. They hear about it from other people. It's a small world. Um, they do not need that. Now, it's different when you have a term sheet. You use that. But at the start of a process, if you say this, what will happen usually 95% of the time is all the investors will just wait until hour 71. And I've seen this happen. The founders go to market. They give us an artificial timeline. They say, we're expecting term sheets on Friday. And Thursday night, they don't have a term sheet. And Friday morning, they get phone call, a phone call. And, and the phone call is, hey, we know you were you said the deadline for term sheets was last night. So we waited to hear from you to see whether or not you had a term sheet before we gave you ours. We never heard from you, so we know you don't have an offer. So we called around and found out no one else gave you an offer. We're going to wait. So purely from like a game theory perspective, these weird tight timelines are a terrible idea. From a, a, a psychological situation and a, a relationship perspective, they're also a bad idea because they make investors feel like cattle, which is not nice. No one wants to be made to feel as if they are being herded into something. Yes, you are running an auction. Of course, you're running an auction to discover the highest price and maybe take it, whatever, fine. It's a process, but don't beat people over the heads with that unnecessarily. Create momentum by having a great company at a great process, and then use the momentum that naturally develops out of a good process to push everyone else along. At the same time, don't go in with too high of a price. Don't go in and say, we want 15 on 300. Uh, the way pricing works at Series A's, and this is the most common question about Series A's other than when do we do it, is how do I price? The answer is um, you figure out how much money you need. The investor decides that that's 20% of your company. That's it. If you have more leverage, dilution goes down. If you have less leverage, dilution goes up. It's like a bond price, right? It's like the interest rate and the price. The interest rate is the is the um, uh, leverage and the the price is the price. Um, what will happen if you go in with too high a price is one of two things. One, people will decide you're um, full of yourself and the price is too high and they'll just kick, kill the process. Or you've undercut yourself and they'll realize, oh, this is a time to get a steal which might trigger a fundraise, but then you've left uh, significant ownership on the table. Um, Lucas, yes, figuring out how much money you need is tricky, for sure. Um, it is not an exact science. Don't pretend that it is. Um, and choosing a number actually influences the process. If you ask for too much money or a large, the larger the round is, the fewer firms can do it, right? If you're asking for a $20 million round, 
it's only firms that have, you know, over half a billion dollars in their funds that really, really do that usually. And it requires more political capital on the, in the partnership, which means a more senior partner or someone who's willing to go a lot, um, do a lot more for you. So on balance, if you can raise less, raise less. It's an easier path to a fundraise for what it's worth. Um, and then I could spend an hour talking about preempts and people who think they've been preempted because someone tells them that they really like them and want to do the deal. The only preempt that counts is a term sheet in your hand. And I know that sounds insane. I know people are like, oh, an investor couldn't possibly give us a term sheet without me going through a process and pitching the partnership. Wrong. I've seen, I've literally seen investors send term sheets to companies they've only met once. It happens. You just have to be thoughtful about it. Okay. I could talk in a million different directions here, as you can tell. Uh, I think I like photography only a little bit more than I like thinking about fundraising. So, uh, in the, in the time we have left, let's, let's do some questions and then, and then, uh, you know, the, there's my email address if you want to send questions through. This is, this is great. Thank you, Aaron. So, um, in the remaining time, I'll just jump through some of these Q and A's, which hopefully we can do a little quickly. Um, one here, which is interesting, another one from Lucas is they haven't announced their fundraise yet. He's debating if they should. How should founders think about that? You're successful in a fundraise. Well, how do you time seed that? Or I. This would be a seed. Okay. Um, yeah, because the A, it's a little trickier because you have to generally have to file a form D and it will leak no matter what you do. Mm. Um, I don't think there's any perfect answer on this, like raised a seed quietly thing. I mean, look, announcing that you've raised a high quality seed with good investors <clears throat> will make people pay attention to you. I think the the fear that people have is there's like some competitive risk there. Um, I don't think it actually matters that much when you when you like let that news out. I think that it tends to be one of these things that people like to make into a whole complicated decision process because it's controllable and feels good. Whereas what matters a lot more is how the business is doing and, and how you're preparing for the next round. If you're in a situation though, where you don't have a lot of investor relationships and you need to figure out a way to catalyze those, announcing your fundraise can be helpful because it will make people pay attention. Awesome. Um, another one here, which is interesting is how do people capture interest from investors and essentially pipeline them? Like, what do you recommend as a tool? Is it, just Salesforce? Is it a spreadsheet? Like, are there any other tools that are emerging that you're excited about? Is it Google Doc? Your awesome. spreadsheet, your your CRM should just be a Google Sheet. Um, Salesforce is too heavy. I know there's a lot of like tools coming out that that uh, we try. I tried to build tools for this at YC, and what I found is everyone just reverted to a spreadsheet because it's a fairly simple CRM. And you want something flexible and easy. Just update it. Like, just keep it up to date. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's mainly just the process, right. That you're doing whatever's easiest in terms of process and this notion or whatever. Um, if nine months, you mentioned this at the very beginning, if nine months is too long for a process, what is optimal? Like, what do you think founders should be mm. thinking about and benchmarking in their minds? Yeah. So um, you should book three months for it from like first pitch to close. Um, the way it ends up working is if you have a hot, hot, hot process, you will you will know within 48 hours of your first pitch. Things will just like, just haul. Okay. Past that first 48, most processes, like good, like good strong processes, it's like two weeks first pitch to term sheet. That was kind of a, a benchmark we used to have. It slowed down a little bit. So what I think is if you don't have a term sheet within the first two weeks, it's probably, you're looking at a month to three months. If it's beyond three months, you have no idea. It could still happen, but then the only question is, um, do you keep going? We, we did this analysis at some point, which is kind of a weird one, but we looked at companies at YC that had raised like a good quick round versus ones that raised around eventually versus ones that failed. Mm -hmm. And the only difference between the ones that like failed versus the ones that eventually succeeded were the, the ones that succeeded just kept trying. They just kept finding new ways to new investors. You know, if I ask anyone on this call to name, you know, the VC firms they want to pitch or whatever, my guess is most of you could name 10 to 15, maybe 20 firms. So like a thousand firms led series A's in the last year or 18 months. There's people out there. Some of them are weird. Some of them are hard to reach, but there's a hell of a lot more investors than you realize. You just have to find a way to them, which is, which is hard. Yeah. 
One question we have here from Chris Preeb is how to respond to VCs asking for customer intros. Like how do you just handle this as a dynamic? Because some yeah. customers can be really sensitive in terms of like you reaching out to them. You don't want to give 15 people, you know, one reference that's a customer. How have you yeah. seen people do this effectively? <clears throat> Um, so there's a different answer at different points in the process. If it's like during coffee meetings and stuff, the answer is no. Um, now, look, if they see you have logos on your website, they're going to call them if they're interested. People do what they, what do they call it? Working outside in. They like, they like to use that word. Um, if it's during the fundraising process, again, it's a question of leverage. And so the degree to which you have to do this is inversely proportional to your leverage. Usually you want to save customer intros until the very end that people have gone all the way through full partnership meetings and are about to issue a term sheet. Um, or ideally post-term sheet, which happens quite a bit, actually. It's like confirmatory diligence. Um, the way you fob it off is you basically say, listen, I understand that you want to talk to them. You, As you can imagine, there's a lot of people asking for that information right now. We can't overwhelm with our customers. It's not their job. So, you know, if we're talking final partnership and, and we're at the final stages, happy to introduce you. You can't stop them, again, from going and finding their own way to those invest to those customers, but you can protect them a little bit. One, one last thing on that, though, make sure you prep your customers. If you mention a customer in your deck, they're going to get phone calls. Make sure that your champion is prepared to take those calls and knows what to say. Yeah, that's a great call out. We have uh, two questions. This will be our last one. Two questions, uh, which are pretty much the same from Sachin and Blaine, which is how do you use PR building up to a fundraise? Like how should you think about PR as a part of your process? Yeah, similar. It's a similar thing to like the uh, the do we announce our fund our our seed thing. Um, I think PR can be helpful in creating awareness around the company and creating some inbound interest. But unless you are a master of press manipulation, it's not really worth the incremental effort relative to like doing investor coffees or focusing on the business. Honestly, um, the the the. Um, other side of that answer is creating a whisper campaign from your investors. So if you have a great set of angels who are well connected and seed investors, like the, the goal, the goal as a founder, by the way, with your investors, your existing investors, is to be so damn good that they're talking about you when they have their own cough. I don't know if everyone knows this, but 60% of investor time is met is like or 70% of 60% of investor time, let's say, is meeting with companies. The rest of it is meeting with other investors and up and down the stack. And so what you want to be happening is when they're meeting with the upstream, yeah, earlier investors, that those early investors are talking about their best companies. You want that to be you. And so when you're getting ready to fundraise, to the extent that you can, tell all your existing angels and seed investors, hey, we're going out in a month. I need you to like basically shill for us for the next month. Say how well we're doing, how much you love us, like how, how awesome we are. Like get people talking about that because that does have a positive impact. Awesome. We'll wrap there. Thank you so much for joining us today, Aaron. This was awesome. And uh, we hope to have you live at some point in the future. I would love that. Thank you all for uh, for joining today. Thanks Village team for organizing this. This was great and hope to hear from founders from some of you soon. Awesome. Thanks everybody for joining. Bye. Bye.